my name's Matt Kennedy, and this is the Steadfast Podcast. This podcast exists to use Bible study and theological teaching to encourage you to be steadfast in your faith. Thank you for taking time out of your day to check out the Steadfast Podcast. I hope today's episode is an encouragement to you. This week on the Steadfast Podcast, we are going to do a Theology Explainer episode on the Doctrine of Revelation. For some, or maybe even most of you, when you saw the word Revelation, you thought of the book of Revelation, as in the 66th book of the Bible, the 22 of possibly the most intriguing and hard to understand chapters of the Bible. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but that is not what we are talking about today. You see, the branch of theology that would take on that subject is eschatology. And maybe one day we'll do an episode or a couple episodes on that But today is the doctrine of Revelation. So what is the doctrine of Revelation? In Christian theology, the doctrine of Revelation is all about God revealing Himself to mankind. It answers the question, how do we know God? And you would be hard-pressed to find a more important question than that, because we are made to know God. You see, our God is a relational God. He desires relationship with His people for their good and to the glory of His name. For that relationship to happen, or any relationship to happen for that matter, both sides must come to know one another. Between us and God, we know our all-knowing God knows everything about us. But we also have to know Him for this to be a relationship. He is also a God of order, not one of confusion. It does not please God for mankind to live as though they are aimlessly chasing shadows all their days. He wants us to have clarity on what life ought to look like clarity on who he is. And considering he is the maker of life, he's a really good source for us when we are pondering what should life look like. Now, with all of this, God desires for us to know ourselves more, our sinful condition, and the pathway for our salvation, which he has been working together since before the foundations of the world. Christian theologians generally agree that there are two primary methods at which God, in His wisdom and His sovereignty, has revealed Himself to us. Now, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you on this one. When I started charting out what I felt was important for us to cover with this doctrine, it got a little bit out of hand. I mean, it really got out of hand fast. So, to keep the length of episodes reasonable, I'm splitting this into two episodes. So, this week, we will discuss the first method that God in His wisdom and sovereignty has revealed Himself to us. And then next week, we will discuss the second method that God in His wisdom and sovereignty has revealed Himself to us. So, really, this is Theology Explainer on the Doctrine of Revelation, Part 1. The first method, that God in His wisdom and sovereignty has revealed Himself to us, is what is called general revelation. One of the primary places we get this idea in the Bible is found in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Quote, For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Paul is telling us that God's attributes have been clearly perceived since the creation of the world. Now understand this. Moses is the guy that God used to write down Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That means in all the days of Genesis, in the 400 plus years between Genesis and Exodus, that God's attributes, His power, and His nature were even on display then, even before our earliest scripture was written down. See, this is where general revelation comes in. General revelation is God revealing himself to mankind primarily through the means of creation itself, but he also reveals himself through things like history and humanity. Now, not all theologians will include history and humanity in the doctrine of general revelation, but enough do that I think it's worth our consideration. And one thing before we really dive into this three-legged stool of creation, history, and humanity I want us to understand this is not just something for those back in the days of Genesis, right? This is something for 
the modern day person, the person back in Paul's day, really throughout history, this has remained true. God has been consistently revealing himself in many ways. So we are going to spend the bulk of this episode working through the idea of God revealing himself in creation, God revealing himself through history, and God revealing himself through humanity. First up, we're going to talk about creation. This is the part of general revelation that I believe has the most to teach us. It is the most convincing of evidences and really the one that Paul probably had in mind when he wrote what we had already read in Romans 1. So in Psalm 19, verse 1, the psalmist says this, quote, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork, end quote. The idea is that when a person looks up to the sky on a star-filled night, that he can perceive the power of the Creator. I mean, what's incredible about this is that as men have advanced, as we have progressed through history, as technology has been improving, is that mankind is now even more aware of the magnitude, the glory, the complexity, the sheer inconceivable size of our universe, of our star-filled universe, and that only adds to the glory of God. Yet, one can know nothing of the vastness of space and the universe, but he can look up at the sky and say, hey, this was not an accident. This is purposeful. And the one who gave it purpose is the God I must worship, that I must be drawn to. I'm merely saying here that scientific advancement in astronomy and physics, that it really only adds to the truth that God is greater than our minds can even begin to comprehend. Either way, if we understand science or not, the power of God on display through the vastness of the universe is incredible. But it's not just looking up at space, though that is the example the psalmist gives. You could look at the splattering, vibrant colors in a sunset and say that God must appreciate beauty and creativity. He could have made the sunset or sunrise or whatever else bland, but he chose to make it colorful and vibrant and beautiful. You could look at the ocean stretching out further than your eyes can see, knowing that it is full of complex and diverse life, and recognize a creator must have done this, and a creator has appreciation for certain things. Because on the days of creation, God could have said, hey, one type of fish is enough. But instead, what he did is created this unimaginably diverse ecosystem of marine life, where you have things that crawl on the ocean floor, you have fish with lanterns on their heads, you got fish that eat other fish, you have whales that are so big that we need to measure them by school buses. It is unbelievable what is within the ocean, and all of that points to a creator who is an intelligent designer who is appreciative of things like complexity and beauty and variety. How intelligent must he be to put all of this together? Now, if you look in Job 38 through 41, we see that God points out all kinds of things to Job. Things in creation. He points out mysteries to Job that are clearly beyond Job. He asks him questions that he knows Job cannot answer because Job's not the creator. Job's not God. He's a mere man and has really no full appreciation of the mysteries in creation. Yet God does. You see, creation reveals that there is something, or maybe I should say there is someone, who is so much bigger than we could ever begin to imagine. All the complexity, all the mystery, all the wonder is directed at glorifying our Creator God. Look at the world, the stars, or anything else and recognize this is not random. This is not accident. This didn't happen by chance. We did not come from nothing a scientist would have us believe. We have an intentional, glorious designer God. And there is nothing greater in life than to seek to know Him. We are drawn to the glorious things, the majestic things, the things that fill us with awe and wonder. And that's exactly how God has wired all of this to be. So he made this world full, this creation full of awe and wonder and mystery, knowing that we are drawn to it for our delight, but ultimately so that we may be drawn to him. We can easily see that creation reflects God's awesome power, his creativity, his artistic nature, his intelligence, that we can even begin to begin to begin to comprehend. But there's, there's really more. 
There's a passage in the Psalms that I, I think really reveals how nature reveals God's goodness in His provision. And you could even say that it reveals His fatherhood over creation, His delight in the creatures He has created. Now, this is going to be a lengthy passage, but I think it presses into something well worth our consideration. As I read, I want you to take note of a couple things. Take note of how many ways the psalmist references that God provides for his creatures and how he so clearly delights in the delight of his creation. So here we go. Consider Psalm 104, verses 10 through 28. Quote, You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen men's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests, the storks has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, the rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons, the sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness, and it is night when all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until evening. O Lord, how many fold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. End quote. Don't you just love that last line? When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. The more you contemplate how God provides to all, from the greatest to the least, you see His heart and His character. You see how He has invested in every detail, every ecosystem on the earth. Whether we're talking about badgers, or lions, or birds, or mankind, or even Leviathan, whoever that might be, God is caring for his creation. And you may want to push back here and say, I thought we were talking about general revelation. Why are you quoting a passage from the Bible? That's not general revelation. Well, in this, what we see the psalmist observe is how he is perceiving God's goodness and God's provision in all of creation. So we're really quoting someone who is observing general revelation. So we've covered several things that we can learn about God through His creation. I mean, we've talked about His power, His creativity, His intelligence, His provision, and His goodness. And there's so much there, and there's so much more that we didn't cover. To me, creation is the strongest leg between the three legs of general revelation. But that doesn't mean that our next one doesn't have its place. So now we're going to move on to the idea of history in general revelation. So this is, it's weaker, it's less obvious means of revelation, but it is still worth our mentioning in consideration. Think about how the Bible speaks on God's sovereignty over the nation. For example, Job chapter 12, verse 23, quote, He makes nations great, and he destroys them. He enlarges nations and leads them away, end quote. And one more example, Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, quote, He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. We could list more verses that say very similar things, but I think you get the idea. God works through kings and kingdoms. He causes them to rise. He causes them to fall. 
The idea here is that if we look at how nations rise and fall, we'll see things that give evidence for what God approves of and what God doesn't approve of. Or you may see evidence of God working to a goal. Now, I know this is less clear than creation. Most people can get behind, all right, I'm going to look at this guy. I'm going to see thousands of stars up there. I'm going to see that I am small and something out there is great. I can get it, right? But then you're like, ah, history, does that mean I'm going to have to read a book? Does that mean I'm going to have to pay attention to current events? What does that mean? Dr. Millard Erickson, in his book Christian Theology, uses Israel as an example for how we can learn about God, how God has revealed himself in history. We're not going to really talk about any specific point of the Old Testament, really just Israel's existence in general. Israel is and has always been a small nation and has always had strong enemies. I mean, if you think about where God has placed this nation, Israel, He has put Israel at this like intersection between Europe and Asia and Africa. He has put them in a place that have all of these enemies around them who are very violent towards their neighbors. And really, there are so many other nations and kingdoms that were in similar situations, and they were all blotted out by invaded kingdoms. They were all taken off into slavery and stopped existing. Israel... Against all odds, though they have been conquered most, multiple times, so they have been enslaved multiple times, against all odds, time and time again, has been preserved. The thing is, it's a mystery. Israel, if we're really honest with this, if there was no God out there, Israel would have stopped existing somewhere in Old Testament times. Israel would have gone up against a foe that was too strong. Maybe it was the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, whomever, and they would have stopped. So the fact that Israel continues against all odds, time and time again, it implies that there is actually a God who has selected this people and is preserving this people. Now we're still talking with history, but let's turn the conversation a little bit. Consider that if a nation rises to power, but then suffers damages, that perhaps... Just maybe they are under God's judgment, that God's wrath is kindled against their immorality. Not to be too America-centered here, but the United States does seem like a pretty good example of this in the modern day. I mean, we have risen to power, right? We have been considered a superpower in the 20th and 21st century. Really, against all odds, we're so young. We're such a young nation. The argument could be made that we're seeing decline. So the question is, is that decline representative of man just mismanaging? Or is that decline from there being a God out there who has set what is right, what is wrong, and has declared that we are doing what is wrong and we must there suffer under his judgment? These are the questions we ask when we consider general revelation that may be present in history. Again, creation is a much better glimpse, but history should not be discounted. When we discuss the other method of revelation next week, I think we'll be able to look back to history and see it through a more clear lens. I think history is one of those pieces of general revelation that can fill in gaps if we already have a framework to work with. The last leg of general revelation that we're going to talk about today is humanity. This is a point that not everyone agrees on, or maybe I should probably say Not everyone defines it the same way. Generally speaking, though, humanity, in terms of general revelation, it is the observation that human beings are the only species out there on the whole planet who are so clearly drawn to worship. And we are a species that cares deeply for morality, that which is right, that which is wrong. We are driven by a conscience. Now listen, you will not find frogs building an altar. You will not see a lion contemplating the morality whether it is right for him to hunt the gazelle. God made us humanity. He made us differently. Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15 say this, quote, For when the Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. End quote. Paul is telling us that the Gentiles, they didn't have the scriptures. They didn't hear the specifics about God. But they have something on their hearts that's really hard to explain. They have a conscience, just like the people who have received the law, which says that the law is not just something we receive externally, but there's something internally that has been planted there. Paul is spelling out a phenomenon with mankind that is undeniable. Even 
by modern scholars. There were a group of anthropologists from the University of Oxford who did a study on moral rules that really could be found wherever in the world you go. And here's what they found. Quote, the rules help your family, help your group, return favors, be brave, defer to superiors, divide resources fairly, and respect others' property. End quote. Those are seven rules that this group of anthropologists have found to be universal rules that are morally good all over the world. How would it be possible for cultures on different continents to develop the same morality? How would it be possible for people groups with zero interactions or awareness of one another develop the same sense of good? See, these are things evolution could never account for. Because there are things that cultures have deemed good that are clearly not for self-preservation. Instead, some of these things are actually costly. If they were looking for their own best good, they would not do some of these other things. There's something else at work here. Perhaps the conscience bears witness to a good creator God who put that on our hearts. Perhaps the existence of a common law actually bears witness to a common law giver. Clearly, there is more to knowing God than the seven things the anthropologists found. However, I would venture to guess that with more study and digging around the world, they might just find there are many other universal laws of morality within all of mankind. As I was thinking about that concept, there's a quote from C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, that came to mind. What you may or may not know about C.S. Lewis is that he was an atheist at one point. He was really convinced that there was no God that could ever possibly exist. However, he came to a point where he came to a saving place in Christ and actually started writing books and letters and essays and articles all about God, Christianity, theology, all the sort. He had a radical conversion here. He goes from atheist to lover of God. And in his book, Mere Christianity, he wrote about this transition a little bit. He says, quote, My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? If the whole show was bad and senseless from A to Z, so to speak, why did I, who was supposed to be part of the show, find myself in such a violent reaction against it? End quote. You see, C.S. Lewis was understanding that God has written good on our hearts, that there is something intrinsic in us that understands what is just and unjust, understands this morally straight line, Yes, we can see the crookedness in our world because we have a concept of what is straight. This was a revolutionary thought for him, that God actually has used humanity to give a law of morality that speaks to a law giver, a morality giver, something beyond ourselves, someone who is good and right and just. So in a nutshell, that's general revelation. We can learn so much about God through creation, and we can also learn about Him through history and humanity. However, as you might have guessed, general revelation as a discipline is not without its flaws. For one, we live in a sin-tainted world. Romans 8 tells us that creation itself is groaning, that it is suffering in the bondage of futility. Paul wrote that it wasn't creation's choice, but rather he who subjected it. Now, if you turn the page all the way back to the beginning in Genesis, what you're going to remember is that way back in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve had sinned, God told Adam, he said, the ground is cursed because of you. Because of the sin that Adam and Eve had unleashed into the world, creation itself, the ground itself, was now under the curse of sin. The curse on creation taints what we can know. And that curse flows into our vision as well. You see, our sin can easily cause us to misinterpret things in creation. Surely we can come up with examples of that in history, most dramatically, those who would worship animals. But in modernity, we can also find examples of pastors interpreting shades of transition in creation or or grays in creation as a way to argue unbiblical points on sexuality. So we are limited. I would say while general revelation can tell us a lot about God and it can deepen our worship, but even if we interpreted it rightly, it has its limits. We need more details. 
Perhaps general revelation can start a fire of desire to know this amazing God. But it cannot stop there. And fortunately, God doesn't stop there. He kept going. He was like, no, I want you to know me more. I want you to have a deeper knowledge of who I am. So, join us next week when we will get into the second method that God in His wisdom and sovereignty has revealed Himself to us. Thanks for listening to the Steadfast Podcast. I want to remind you that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Paul wrote this, quote, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain, end quote. So in light of biblical truth, let us be steadfast, immovable. Let us remember that through Jesus, not one labor is in vain, not one trial is in vain, not one effort in all of our lives is in vain. Because he gives purpose, and that purpose rings through eternity. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget, if you've got questions you would like answered, you can email me at matt at steadfastpodcast.com.